Well, I'm delighted to be here. I'm, I'm honored to be part of the uh, program here at uh, the Archaeology Cafe program at Casa Vicente. And uh, as Doug said, my remarks are meant to be a spring for, springboard for discussion. So um, I'm going to try to hit a few things, but sort of briefly, so that uh, most of tonight's program can be directed by things that you all have to say. Uh, first, the title of my uh, presentation, the portion that I'm going to be structuring this evening, uh, would be The Role of Pottery in Understanding the Ancient Southwest. Uh, but in the spirit of fractured fairy tales, if anybody's familiar with that, uh, Bullwinkle and Rocky, I have a subtitle that's probably appropriate, and that would be Why Are Southwestern Archaeologists So Pot Crazed? Um, I'm going to briefly touch on six areas of pottery-related research. And uh, hopefully that will give you all an opportunity to figurati figuratively as well as literally sink your teeth into something this evening. Um, the first would be archaeological cultures. The next would be chronology. Then sourcing, migration, religion and ideology, and apprenticeship and gender roles. But first, I've got a quote. This comes from Jim Skibo, graduate of the U of A, and it's in his book, Pottery and People, A Dynamic Interaction. Quote, a non-archaeologist would probably be astounded to learn the amount of time and effort prehistorians spend on the study of broken pieces of pottery. But pottery is a link to the lives of everyday people. And pottery, once it appears prehistorically, becomes one of the most frequently recovered artifacts. It also has remarkable preservation once broken into sherds. Archaeologists discovered long ago that details collected on each piece of fired clay are a window into the lives of those who made and used these vessels. What did they eat? How many people lived in a house? How did they organize themselves? Who were their trading partners? These are just some of the questions that have been addressed through detailed analysis of prehistoric pottery. So first I'm going to write some stuff on the board here. Our first topic is archaeological cultures. And you'll notice a theme here this evening. Some musical subtitles. Who are you? Um, when we talk about pottery in the Southwest, you'll hear a lot of discussion about uh, categories such as wares and types. And um, in the formation of archaeological cultures, the idea of the ware is very important in the Southwest. Wares basically represent technological traditions of pottery making that are associated with a particular place and a particular group of people. And um, so wares allow us to address variability over space and variability across different groups of people. And wares are broken up into smaller units called types. So if wares are equivalent to genera, if you have genus and species, the species, the more specific would be types. And I'll talk about types in a little while. But um, in any case, a ware is a group of related types. They have the same technology. And what does that mean? Choices are made by a group of people in a particular place relative to raw materials, forming techniques, vessel shapes, uh, other things like that. And these vessel shapes are related to culturally appropriate uses, things like foodways, recipes. And early archaeologists, as I sort of glossed over earlier, looked at correlations between um, pottery traditions and other ways of making and doing things, like making domestic architecture, ritual architecture, stone tools, and treatment of the dead to produce archaeological cultures, the terms that you hear today like Hoakam, Anasazi, Mogion. So that's one reason that Southwestern archaeologists are pot crazed. It really becomes um, a real important part of how we structure our discussions of the ancient past about cultural groups and also about who's interacting with who. Another important focus for pottery studies is chronology. Does 
anybody really know what time it is? Um, pottery in the Southwest has been a focus for Southwestern archaeologists because uh, of its great uh, ability to inform us on how old a site is or how old parts of a site are. And uh, this is particularly true of painted pottery. We know that painted pottery changed through time, uh, sometimes over a couple of generations, three generations, sometimes in units smaller than a generation. And uh, we can even see changes through time in vessel form uh, that, can be, uh, that can help us to figure different things out. Why is telling time so important? Well, you want to be able to know which sites were occupied at the beginning of the sequence and which in the middle and which in the end to be able to talk about other kinds of changes through time that are going on in, in ancient societies. And you want to know how many people were living in a particular place at one time and how many people were living at a different time. Which sites were occupied contemporaneously? Which people could really be in contact with one another? Which are the latest sites in the Southwest that might link to tribal oral traditions of origin and migration? Pottery can really help with that sort of thing, particularly in the desert Southwest where we don't have a lot of opportunities to use tree ring dating or dendrochronology. And um, painted pottery is used a lot in a lot of different ways for chronology. And I'm not going to get in too deep with these topics because, again, it's supposed to be a springboard for our discussion. But I'll mention them now. And we can come back to them later if you have specific questions. But one specific use that uh, archaeologists put pottery to is in seriation. And that is looking at what types of pottery occur on different sites and where they don't occur. And so you might find that, uh, good use of the flip chart here to discuss seriation. You might find that some sites have A, let's say type A, some types, some sites have types A and B, some, ty some sites have A, B, and C. Some have B and C, and some have C pottery. Does everybody follow that? So you can make an argument that there's a sequence here. The question is always, is this the early end, or is this the late end? Does everybody understand? If you know nothing else about the pottery, you just know that, let's say it had A's painted on it. In some sites, they had A's and B's painted on them, and so on and so forth. You don't know necessarily if A is early or C is early. But if you have some other kind of information to go off of, you would be able to work out a relative sequence. Okay? And so without attaching any firm dates to these archaeological sites, you can then say that sites that only have A are earlier than those that have A and B, and so on and so forth. So that's how seriation works. And of course, stratigraphy relies on the laws of superposition in archaeological sites, such that the normal situation is that you have layers that are laid down one on top of another, where this is the oldest, and this comes next, and this comes next. And so stratigraphy becomes important in terms of um, relative dating of, of pottery types. And now, um, tree ring dating I mentioned earlier, dendrochronology, because archaeologists have excavated hundreds and hundreds or thousands of actually of archaeological sites in the southwest at this point, uh, we're able to say that certain pottery types are associated with particular date ranges. Say, uh, we only find pottery type A in sites that date from 1250 to 1300. Or 1350 to 1450. That's important information. Now you can add actual dates. So chronology. Sourcing. Yes, in archaeology, sometimes, like in life, we hurt the ones we love. But there's a good reason for hurting pottery sherds, uh, and that is to find out where they were made. 
And uh, sourcing has really taught us a lot about Southwestern archaeology. Um, beginning in the 1930s with the work of Anna Shepard, archaeologists looked at tempering material, material that's added to the clay to make it more workable and to prevent it from cracking as it dries out in fires. Uh, it stands to reason that folks are not going to walk very far to get the raw materials that they use to make pottery. And uh, that tends to hold up ethnographically. As we look around the world uh, at groups that make their own pottery, uh, most folks don't walk very far for that stuff, especially temper, which tends, tends to be pretty heavy, and clay. Uh, paints are a different story. Glazes are a different story. But getting back to petrography, what Shepard did is she looked at uh, the crushed up pieces of rocks, the minerals, in potsherds and linked them to the different kinds of rocks and minerals that were available out on the landscape and made some sophisticated arguments about pottery being made in one place and winding up in another. And the focus at that time was pretty much on exchange, so trade. Um, since the 1930s, a number of different methods have been developed to look at um, where the raw materials for pottery have come from. Um, neutron activation analysis in various forms is kind of, um, I would say, the bee's knees uh, uh, for some things. Of course, the petrofaces approach that's practiced by archaeologists at Desert Archaeology Incorporated and has been employed by um, the Center for Desert Archaeology and me and lots of other folks is also fantastic, and especially in the desert basins of the Southwest. But um, what's different about petrography in general and the petrofaces approach specifically is that uh, different between those and NAA is that instrumental neutron, neutron activation analysis, or INAA, focuses on the clay itself rather than the temper. And so using that technique, archaeologists can match the clay used to make the pot with the source of the clay, as opposed to the temper used to make the pot with the source of the temper. And um, these techniques have been applied uh, to give us some really pretty incredible insights to trade, as I mentioned before, but also migration, uh, which will be the, our next topic. Um, and the reason for that is, as you can imagine, there, there are many different ways that you can get similar looking material culture in two or more places. You can have trade of objects from one place to another. You can have copying of objects made in one place by people living in another place. or you can have people moving from one place to another and bringing their technological traditions with them and making them in their new homeland. And so the first step in distinguishing among those different processes is answering the question, well, where was this stuff made? Everybody get that? And then you go on to further arguments. Okay. This is a multimedia presentation, so hang on. It's, it's worth it, I hope. OK. Yes, immigrant song. Uh, pottery has been used quite a bit over the last decade or so to look at evidence of migration in the prehistoric Southwest. And the way that people go about doing this uh, is to start with that sourcing and say, okay, here we have a technology that's been brought from another place to this place. And then they look at what archaeologists refer to as technological style. They look at things that are invisible in the finished product or things that are not easily copied. In other words, things that have to be passed down between, say, mother and daughter, or father and son, or within social groups, things that you're taught how to do, things that are hard to copy. Um, paint recipes, ways of forming pots, ways of joining handles, things like that. But even in painted pottery, uh, some of the visible traits that are really highly visible are useful in tracking social groups, including immigrants. So for example, um, a bunch of Archaeologists went out and 
worked with people who make their own pottery and found out that the spatial organization of design for a pot, so in other words, making these four quadrants offset in this way with negative space, that spatial organization or that symmetry organization is important in that that's a tradition that people are brought up in and that's how they analyze decorations. But that the individual shapes that might be drawn in these spaces, like triangles or circles or different kinds of triangles with hooks on them, things like that, these motifs, these smaller units of design, are easily transmitted from person to person or from pot to person, whereas the precise, correct spatial organization of design is not easily diffused. In other words, archaeologists and ethnoarchaeologists went out among pottery making people and said, here's some stuff that your neighboring group makes. Can you copy it? And they do a bad job, generally. Uh, and really, even when they copied and they did a good job, they were always making reference to their traditional spatial repertoire. Okay? Um, another interesting way to approach this is through brush stroke analysis. And this is something that was really refined, I think, by Scott Van Curren, another graduate of our, our program at the U of A. Um, what he did is to look at the order in which designs are put together. And this is very highly patterned. And he was able to show immigrants moving into different places based on the way that designs were put together, the order of the actual brush strokes. So that's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Um, in, in, applying, uh, in, apply, in using pottery in questions of migration, we also try to look at um, not just aspects of, of individual pots that are less visible than other aspects or difficult to transmit, but also specific kinds of pots that are used in a household setting as opposed to a public setting. Uh, mundane utilitarian tools as opposed to flashy objects that you take to a party. Um, and so, uh, for example, uh, when my colleagues from the Center for Desert Archaeology and I are looking at immigrants from northern Arizona, evidence of immigrants from northern Arizona, we're looking at pottery making tools that themselves are made out of clay and um, would not be the sort of thing that um, foreigners would necessarily see or that would have a lot of exchange value, if you understand what I'm saying. So that's another thing that's consistent with this approach. Second to last. Screwing up the scenery and what is it? Messing with my mind. Or... Anyway, sign, sign everywhere, a sign. Um, archaeologists, particularly these days in the Southwest, but this kind of started about as long ago as 15 years, I guess, uh, have been really, really interested in religion and ideology and what pottery can tell us about that. And related to this also is social organization. But, um, most approaches have looked at what we would call recurring motifs or icons, things that are recognizable as flowers or stars or butterflies or birds or snakes. And uh, Southwestern archaeologists talk about things using this evidence, things like the flower world of the ancient Yiddo Aztecan speakers. And I see that you're going to hear Kelly Hayes Gilpin talk about that. And that ought to be a real treat. I, I encourage you to come to that. Uh, I want to be Kelly Hayes Gilpin when I grow up. It's true, isn't it? I've been saying that for years. See? Um, she'll probably be freaked out about that when she sees this. <laughs> anyway, the flower world of the ancient Yiddo Aztecans. Um, also the Kachina religion. Um, that's been a real research uh, project that has benefited from ceramic analysis and looking at the early depictions of Kachinas. Um, and speaking of Kachinas, Sometimes you can get really, really fascinatingly precise information about kachinas, or kachinam is the proper uh, plural. Uh, and as an example, it just came off display in the, in the lobby of the State Museum. But on the State Museum website, we have a thing called Object of the Month. If you look at the November Object of the Month, you'll see 
a pot, a bowl, that has the earliest identifiable kachina ceremony that we've ever seen. It's about 600 years old. Don't want to spoil it and tell you anymore. Check it out. Um, but aside from the flower world and the Kachina religion, we also have uh, a concept called the Southwest cult, which was uh, a concept that was introduced by Patricia Crown looking at the spread of the Salado phenomenon. So, but lots and lots, lots and lots of research is going on in that area, and, and I figure that will probably be a focus of questions. So I'm going to move on, trying to keep it on schedule, to my final topic. Yes, mother's a little helper. No, we're not talking about Valium. <laughs> we're talking about apprenticeship and gender roles. Apprenticeship and gender roles have really been a focus of Southwestern archaeology, I think, over the last uh, five years, five or six years. And um, these are the questions that are on people's mind. These are the things inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> How do people go about learning pottery making in different groups? Is there a lot of investment by teachers? What does it mean when you find what we call multi-authored vessels? Say a pot that's been formed by a skilled potter and painted by an unskilled potter, or vice versa. Or sometimes pots where the design has been laid out by a skilled potter and filled in by someone who's not so good. How young are potters starting in pottery making? And what, does, what do all these, the answers to all these questions, how does this relate to specialized production? How does it relate to the economics of past societies? How does this all relate to social organization? These are the questions that keep people up at night. And so with that, I'm going to open it up to you all. So thanks. Thank you, Patrick. This is fantastic uh, coverage of, of pottery in the Southwest. Um, we're going to open the floor to questions now. And once again, I just ask you, please raise your hand so I can get, the, uh, get your question recorded for the film. And we'll take it from there. Questions? All the way back. OK. Let's see here. I'm constantly amazed by the very detailed uh, paintings that are on pottery sometimes, perfectly straight lines, lines that go all the way around the pot and all connect in just perfect symmetry. But do we have any idea if they measure like I would? <laughs> or if this just flows out of them, they know it so well that they can just strike a perfect line and make a perfect uh, piece of art like that? That's a great question. Did everybody hear the question? Um, you know, for most of southwestern prehistory, the evidence we have, and actually of the historic, the evidence of the historic period as well, is that most people do not actually sketch out designs on pottery before they're they're executed. There is some evidence that during um, the toward the end of the Hohokam sequence, the end of the Hohokam red on buff sequence, that um, people sometimes scratched out designs a little bit and that these are covered with paint, or at least some people believe that. But for the most part, um, we have no evidence that, that those designs were sketched out ahead of time. And um, one of the reasons that archaeologists feel pretty strongly about this is because of studies like Van Curren's looking at things at the level of the brush stroke. But it's a great question. Um, Patrick, could I quickly ask a question? Um, you mentioned neutron activation, which just sounds really cool, but could you describe what that actually is? Sure. First of all, don't try neutron activation at home. <laughs> okay? Now, this isn't Mythbusters, but trust me. You don't want to do this. Okay, the way neutron activation analysis works is uh, you take a sample of pottery and um, you remove a portion of the middle of it by sanding off the uh, interior surface and the exterior surface to remove contaminants. 
so that you're focusing on the actual clay that was used to produce the pot and not a decorative clay that might have been applied on the outside surfaces or the inside surface, okay? And uh, that stuff is ground up and it's put in a special glass vial and put in a nuclear reactor and exposed to neutrons, which activate it. And it produces unstable radioactive isotopes. This is more than you wanted to know, I bet. Nope. <laughs> produces unstable radioactive isotopes of all of the elements that comprise that clay, such that you can measure them using decay recording and counting devices, and therefore find out which elements are present and their concentration, yes, in parts per billion. I said billion. So it's, sort of, it's almost like pottery DNA. And when you get a match between raw materials and um, pottery this way, it's a really strong, strong inference in archaeology that, that you've been able to link a vessel to the place where it was made. I think we had a question right here. Yeah, it fits. Hello. It fits in uh, with this discussion presently is how do you know the order of brush strokes? I mean, what's the technique for deciding that or learning that? That's a fantastic question. Um, and typically, the way that that is done is by looking very, very closely with the proper light for overlaps. And this is most successful when looking at pottery that has some mineral content to the paint, because you can actually see stratigraphy in the painting. You can see how the lines are laid down. It's the same principle as the archaeological site, only on a much smaller scale. I've done it. It's really cool. The question is, what instruments do you use? Um, usually, this can be accomplished with a simple 10-power uh, hand lens and a good light. OK. Um, while we're on the topic, uh, could you describe what uh, petrophases analysis is, is in, what, what is a petrophase or petrophase? Sure, sure. Um, phases, and, well, petrophases, petro meaning rock, and phases sort of variety of. Um, and the idea of petrophases analysis is that in desert basins, like we have all over southern Arizona, these are surrounded by different mountain chains. And those mountains are made out of different kinds of rocks. And those rocks weather in different ways. And they become sands in the side drainages and main drainages that drain the southwest, such that one can go out and collect sand in different places and characterize the presence, concentration, and amount of weathering for each of the minerals that are present. And in that way, also look at potsherds that come back to the laboratory and try to find matches between these profiles that you have for each of the raw material sources or petrophases out on the landscape. Does that do it? I had a question. Um, the neutron dating? Neutron activation analysis? Yeah, that. Um, is that applicable to any other um, artifacts or things other than pottery? Is that used in any other, you know, uh, remains? Neut neutron activation analysis has been used on other things. It's been used on uh, obsidian. It's been used on, uh, I think, a few other different archaeological materials. It's really, really expensive. And it's destructive. It requires destructive analysis. And so now, for example, with obsidian, what most people go with is what's called EDXRF or energy dispersive x-ray fluorescence, which is another sourcing technique. <laughs> I'll get to you later. <laughs> that allows you to make matches between um, obsidian, in this case, and the sources uh, from what, like, uh, OK, obsidian being volcanic glass, it's used to produce stone tools with nice, really sharp edges. Uh, the trace elements that are impurities in obsidian, actually, uh, characterize different sources of obsidian. And at this point, uh, Steve Shackley, who you'll be hearing from in the future if you come to this excellent series, 
will tell you all about this. But it's the same principle as petrophases analysis and um, similar to what we do with neutron activation analysis. Except in the case of obsidian, uh, there's really excellent linkage between the sources and the artifacts. That's not always the case with pottery. Sometimes it's difficult to make the matches. I think we had a question here. Uh, can you say what time frame or organizational level that pottery specialization began? Like, was it, you know, early villages, early or more at the larger community level? Thank you for that question. Um, there, there seem to be sort of two different kinds of pottery specialization in the Southwest in prehistoric times. One would be what we refer to as community specialization, such that almost everybody or many, many people who are living in a particular village or groups of villages nearby are participating in the production of a particular kind of pottery and they are exchanging that product with people in other communities who do not make pottery. And this would characterize sort of the middle of the Hohokam prehistoric sequence in southern Arizona. The period from about probably the AD 800s to about the 1100s in southern Arizona, more or less. Uh, it, during that period of time, almost all of the red on buff pottery that's found all over the American Southwest was made in a very small number of villages in the Phoenix Basin, in the southern end of the Phoenix Basin near the Gila, for example. Um, we also see that sort of thing, that community specialization um, during, uh, in uh, villages in the Four Corners region in southeastern Utah in the production of San Juan Redware uh, in the period between about AD 900 and 1100, give or take, would be my guess, or my recollection at this point. Uh, another kind of specialization that we see is more like household specialization, such that not every household in the village had a pottery producer, but some did. And so there were people who were better at making pottery, and there were people who did not make any pottery, and they worked out ways that everybody got pottery. Um, does that answer your question? Next? Yeah? To what extent it, do the sites in the Southwest share a common time base that has been established? And what do people in your profession believe the accuracy of, of dating is? Is that plus or minus 10 years, plus or minus 50 years, or what? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I would say that in the Southwest, many, many different dating techniques are applied. The most precise, of course, is dendrochronology, which is individual calendar years that is not always possible uh, to apply. And uh, even with dendrochronology, one has to be careful about interpreting the results. You know? um, and uh, Jeff Dean, who is uh, really God's gift to tree ring dating uh, <laughs> at uh, the tree ring lab in, uh, at the U of A, uh, specialized in teaching about the theory and method of dendrochronology and other chronological techniques. But to make a long story short, um, using dendrochronology under the right circumstances with enough dates and enough context, one can talk about this particular room was built in the spring of 1257. This room was added in the winter of 1258. Uh, this roof was repaired in 1247, things like that. Um, in the desert, with a few exceptions, there are some dendrochronologically placed sites in southern Arizona. Uh, in southern Arizona, we are typically at the mercy of um, pottery-based dating, archaeomagnetic dating, and radiocarbon dating. And... Um, 
Radiocarbon dating is, is calibrated with dendrochronology, but uh, it has, of course, plus or minus values, and that depends on uh, the sample itself, the quality of the sample itself, and it also depends on the, the, the gross age of the sample. The closer you get to the present, the bigger plus or minus you'll get. Archaeomagnetic dating is calibrated with radiocarbon dating. Radiocarbon dating is much less precise than dendrochronology. So with archaeomagnetic dating, you have an additional, you have the sloppiness of radiocarbon to go along with that. Um, it depends on how fine you want to work. With pottery, when we talk about uh, ceramic dates, when we talk about pottery, tree ring dates associated with pottery types, um, there are places and times where you can talk about things like date ranges like 1250 to 1300, 1300 to 1385. And that's based on hundreds and hundreds of sites up where there are trees in the pine country. And the assumption is that when you find those well-dated types in other parts of the Southwest, that you're basically in the same chronological ballpark. And to be honest, in most cases, if archaeologists want to make meaningful inferences about chronology in an archaeological site, they usually are bringing many, many different lines of evidence to bear. That's a great question. So I guess the short version is, the precision and accuracy varies quite a bit depending on the technique and also the samples that you're working with. You're welcome. All right, it's a ringer. I'm going to admit it. <laughs> you talked about tools for making pottery. And I happen to know that you sort of have a favorite. So could you talk a little bit about how one comes to recognize that something is a tool for making pottery and then how significant that kind of thing can be. Is there anything more significant? <laughs> oh, they're groaning already. Um, what, uh, I don't know this woman. What, what this crazy lady who you let in is asking about uh, in the case of the research that the Center for Desert Archaeology is continuing to do with, I might add, its uh, third, I think, National Science Foundation grant related to this work, um, is to track the movement of people out of uh, far, northern, far northeastern Arizona and southeastern Utah into central and southern Arizona and actually west central New Mexico. And one of the key pieces of evidence uh, in the arguments that we make in tracking the immigrants are perforated plates. Um, perforated plates are plate shaped, you know, like the things that you're eating your tapas off of. Uh, and they have holes punched through the rim before being fired. And um, why do we think they're pottery making tools, you ask? Thanks. <laughs> um, it's, an, it's an inference based on context and use wear. Um, when we find whole specimens of these, some of them have been found, well, many of them have been found from the burials of women who traditionally uh, and uh, traditionally ethnographically were the potters, and we assume uh, in most cultures in the past in the Southwest were potters. But they've also been found buried with women in association with the raw materials for making pottery, uh, so clays and tempers. Uh, they've been found with pigment-stained groundstone that was used to make the decorative slips that went on the pottery, and other things that we know are pottery-making tools. They've also been found with tempered clay, so prepared clay, adhering to the concave surface, tempered but unfired clay. So basically what you're talking about is a pot for making pots. They were base molds for keeping a pot in while you're building up the coils. Uh, and also a turntable, a, a, a turntable of sorts. Um, we've also found quite a few examples of these vessels from the San Pedro Valley and from Safford and from other places where they have smudges and fingerprints on them in red clay, which is uh, a decorative clay that was used for making Roosevelt Redware or, or Salado Polychrome Pottery. And um, most of the whole specimens that have been recovered have um, zones of intense use wear on the bottom where they would have been turned 
repeatedly as people were using them in pottery making. So we have these circumferential wear patterns. Now, what do the holes have to do with pottery making? As I always say, as 10 archaeologists, you get 12 answers. <laughs> the answer is they don't have a darn thing to do with pottery making, as far as I'm concerned. Because although most of these vessels have a single circumferential row of holes, many have two rows of holes, some have three, some have a cruciform pattern as well as the circumferential row. Some are perforated halfway around. Some are perforated at the quadrants. Some have little pinpricks where the holes ought to be. Some have holes painted on. <laughs> um, the other thing to know is that these same burials that produce these objects and these same sites that produce perforated plates uh, have many, many, many unperforated plates that have all the same used wear and the same residue on them. And so these seem to be perhaps owner's marks or decoration or things like that. And owner's marks sort of make sense if you think about groups of potters working together. So did that answer your question, ma'am? Stranger lady. OK. Oh, no. Well, you may have already answered it, but uh, it was asserted to me quite heavily that in the Membres culture, it was the women that did the pot making. Absolutely. And very strongly, is that unique to the Membrace? And we, don't, we wouldn't think that it is. And uh, why do we assume that? Well, uh, well, in the case of, uh, actually, I know this to be true definitely of uh, northern Arizona and central Arizona. I'm not sure about southern Arizona. We have an issue in southern Arizona with human remains, and that cremation <laughs> was the traditional way of disposing of human remains for a long period of time. But um, I do not know of a single male burial that has yielded a potter's toolkit. And there are dozens, if not scores, of them uh, along the Mugion Rim and north of the Mugion Rim are always women. So um, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Another question back here, and I don't know if we just play past the microphone? Thank you. Okay, what my question is, is uh, in terms of the adoption of ceramics into the Southwest, where do you see the inspiration coming from and how do you see it in time and space in terms of its spread? Wow. <laughs> That's a mean thing to do to your boss. <laughs> But seriously, folks, uh, I would say that, um, you know, my mother always taught me that if you don't know the answer, say you don't know the answer. Here's what I'll say. There are people probably in this room, because I can't see everybody, but there are people who work for Desert Archaeology Incorporated who are actually working on just this topic right now and have found some of the most important evidence relating to this topic doing, re doing the archaeology related to Rio Muerto, I mean Rio Nuevo. <laughs> and what, what they found, what they found is that the earliest, and I, could, I would stand to be, I am standing, I would be corrected by anyone here who's closer to this research, but what I think they found, if I'm up to the latest stuff, is that they found that the earliest messing around with ceramics in the Southwest really has to do with very small vessels that probably have a ritual function, and that this begins as early as 2100 BC, okay, at early agricultural sites in the Tucson Basin. The first time that we get a true container technology that's related to storage and cooking, as far as I know, that's not widespread until about AD 50 or so. Now, what do we know about the spread? I don't think that, well, I don't know a lot about the spread, but I would say that that's the chronology that we know. We know that it's come in uh, probably earlier than we have irrigation canals. It's come in about the same time we have corn. Lots of interesting things are going on, but, you know, there's more work being done in Tucson all the time. And uh, if anyone's familiar with the work that uh, Desert Archaeology did at Los Pozos related to the, the sewage treatment plant, they're now finding entire 
um, fields with the planting holes and canals and, and spreaders and feeders and things like that. And so I have no doubt that as that work continues, they'll learn more about this topic. But so that's kind of where I would leave it. Does that satisfy you? Yes? OK. Uh, good man, Arthur. Other questions? Oh, uh oh. Oh, man. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Bill. <laughs> that, that was a good job in terms of the recent insights into what's going on uh, with the development of a ceramic. So good, good job. Thank you. Um, this is going to be personal. Uh -oh. um, this what, time it's personal. I'm, <laughs> no. If we could give you a, hap a hypothetical $500,000 MacArthur Genius Grant, what? You got one of those? Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's in my back pocket. <laughs> um, what would you do with those five years of not having to worry about the next budget cut at the Arizona State Museum and just sit down and, and uh, pursue a five-year program of research? How would you spend that money? What would your research issues of, of wow. focus be? And have a good time with this question, Patrick. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, you know, the first thing that popped into my head was we have at ASM, and this is not a commercial for ASM, it's just the truth. We have, um, many of you may know, fantastic mind-blowing collections from Point of Pines, which Point of Pines is, is an iconic archaeological area with a number of archaeological sites that uh, really can tell the story like few others can of the migration of people out of northern Arizona into central and southern Arizona. And uh, despite the fact that most of that archaeology, most of that material had been analyzed from the other sites and published, we do not have a ceramic analysis from or a report on Point of Pines Pueblo itself. And um, having had the good fortune to look at those collections, before I worked with, had the good fortune to work with Arthur, and now that I work with Arthur, seeing them a lot, I know that the potential there is just phenomenal. And, and um, we also know, based on work that other people have done over uh, a long period of time, that uh, the traditional story of, of immigrants from northern Arizona coming to Point of Pines in the mountains of Arizona uh, on, uh, on the Apache Reservation, the traditional story is that conflict developed between the immigrants and the locals. There was a fire that burned out the immigrants, and the immigrants went on their way further south into Safford and the San Pedro and places like that. However, what a lot of research has shown over the last several years is that northern traditions continue at Point of Pines. Northern traditions of pottery, ground stone, architecture, and other things. And what I would do with that hypothetical genius grant would be to put together uh, an existing collections museum field school and bring experts and students in from all over the place who were the best at doing things like looking at um, biological markers of um, origins and uh, ceramic evidence of origins and stone tools and so on and so forth and trying to bring every line of evidence to bear on this classic case of migration in the Southwest. That would be it. That's a good answer. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions tonight? Well, Patrick, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you.